Julia, what is it about consciousness that drives so many people to want to figure it out and study it? Uh, you know, I was in neuroscience, you're in neuroscience, we've explored other areas. Uh, uh, what, what, what is so baffling about consciousness? I think consciousness is so baffling because it's all we've got. So we can't see outside of our daily awareness. We can't see outside of what we experience. Mm -hmm. So that, and that's the way John Searle defines consciousness. I go along with that as a neuroscientist, that it's, it's the daily experience and also the dreaming experience, things of which we are aware. To me, what's so fascinating um, is that that's such a small piece of what's going on. So there's so much of which we are unconscious. To me, that's baffling. The yeah. connection between all these processes of which we are completely unconscious and this tiny little bit of awareness that we then claim is the entire universe. Mm. And so I think it's our grandiosity that says, consciousness is so amazing. It's like a little kid who says, look at, this is so amazing, look what I can do, right? <laughs> and the parent's like, yeah, well, you know, your cytoplasm is my cytoplasm. <laughs> the mother might say that. And I, I, I do feel like that there's a, there's a grandiosity there, and yet it's all very innocent, right? I mean, we all, we all share this grandiosity. So when you see the part of the iceberg that's below the surface, the vast, you're talking about the, the, the stuff in, uh, that, that's uh, subconscious or unconscious in the human mind, you're talking about the totality of reality. I mean, what, what is your differentiation between consciousness and all the rest? So consciousness is the stuff of which we are aware, yep. and then unconsciousness is everything else. So what I, what I, what I, my sense is, from reading the literature and from doing my own work, my sense is that uh, the the brain itself has has these huge amount of has a huge amount of um, unconscious processes. Mm -hmm. I think we could know that we yeah. could be sure about that, and that the conscious processes are a very small piece of that. Where I actually extend that a little is sort of on the on the. Uh, I I think I I am with William James all the way, where in varieties of religious experience at the very end he says, essentially and. So the unconscious mind is actually attached to all of the, everything, <laughs> sort of like, so it's both. So I guess my answer is both. Uh, the unconscious is, 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 are the un, these unconscious processes in the brain. And I think that's how we access a lot of non-local other information that we, is just not usually part of our conscious So that's story. a very big statement that, uh, shall we say, is not supported by uh, a mainstream neuroscience. I mean, you... You certainly have unconscious processes in the brain, and maybe there are two parts of that. You have the, the, the vegetative the stuff that needs to keep us alive, the vagus nerve keeping our heart working, and, and, uh, and uh, digestion, and all the other things uh, regulating the body. Uh, but then the psychological processes, and were the coordination of our motor activities. These are all different kinds of the subconscious activity. But that, that is uh, kind of biologically regulatory. Um, but if you're saying that our unconscious is somehow connected to a uh, outside our skin, I mean, that's an, that sounds very nice and pleasant to say, but that's a really radical comment to make for a scientist. I guess it is. I guess I'm used to it. I guess it is. I also want to go back to your statement, a couple of statements you made about mainstream neuroscience. So. So I, I, I did some work showing that um, physiological responses in humans can precede events to which they seem to be tied. And those physiological responses are unconscious, and this is part of what made me develop this idea and, and take this idea seriously, this idea of unconscious processes. So actually. you're talking about backward causation? Yeah, yeah. And so you, you say it so calmly. I'm used to it. Yeah, so it's, I, I get it. I mean, so it's true that when I give talks and things, the person, people often afterwards will get red faced and say, well, don't you know about the second law of thermodynamics? There's a forward direction of time. And I, I have to remember before I respond that, yeah, um, not everyone's used to it. So let, let me understand that research you're talking about, because that is obviously very significant to you. And I'd like to understand that. So you're saying that an unconscious process, which is a physiological response to some external thing, right. will will precede the external thing. Right. Is it appears to be the case. And yeah. And, and uh, so I got together with um, Patrizio Tresoldi at University of Padova and Jessica Utz at UC Irvine, who's a statistician. 
And um, I decided, we're going to look at a bunch of studies. And they, they agreed they wanted to do this. And um, we got studies from 1978, when the phenomenon that phenomenon was first tested to the year 2010, which is when we were doing the analysis. And we found more than 40 studies, but we culled them down to about 26 that allowed us to test this hypothesis that, in a sense, this is a, a meta-analysis. This is a meta-analysis. So the hypothesis was, in a sense, does um, our unconscious physical process or our unconscious physiology predict a future arousal event? So an arousal event could be, you know, you know, a loud yeah, sure. sound or a picture of a snake about to strike or excitement because you just got a problem right that you didn't think mm -hmm. you would get right. So those are all kind of emotional events that we know after that event occurs but for sure. Would you trigger some yeah. chemical, emotional, Right, hormonal. after that event, yeah. for sure, for decades, we've right. known it, it triggers a oh, response. So the, but the point is that this is looking at the, the, the physiology before the event, right? When the person's not conscious, in fact, no one in the experimental setup knows right. what the event will be, right? right? So everything's randomized. Um, and then comparing that to pre the, the physiology that precedes a neutral event, so seeing a picture of a pair of shoes right. or silence yeah. or something like that. So those are those kind of studies uh, are the ones that we called together for this meta-analysis, and the result was highly significant and very robust to every single... You know, I demanded that we do every conservative point of analysis that we could. So when there were two different ways to calculate effect sizes, I said we're going to choose the more conservative way, the one that gives the lower effect size and makes it look worse, essentially. Right, right. And it still ended up being highly statistically significant. Okay? I so mean, that's, it, where, that's where my uh, willingness okay. to I accept mean, this I, comes I, from. One can get into the methodology. Uh, I'm always a little suspicious of meta-analysis because although you may have been t totally right. appropriate in choosing your sample size, what you what you can't have a choice of are the studies that weren't published, uh, the ones that showed a neutrality of some kind. Uh, so it's but but here's my question. I mean, methodology. At this point, I almost want to give it to you. Okay, let's say it's right. Yeah. What are the implications for that for consciousness? So the implications are for unconsciousness, right? So the implications are we already know that consciousness steps. We already know that in. Actually, I just gave this talk where I asked a room of people, I showed a picture of a tiger uh, in the middle of a scientific talk. And I asked the room of people, how many people knew I was going to show a picture of the tiger? tiger. Not a single hand went up. Right. So it's very robust. That conscious experience, we generally don't know what's about to happen when it's not a predictable event. Right. It's an incredibly robust effect. Right. So that does tell us that. We, we, all, we already knew that. right? This tells us that the properties of the unconscious mind are different. Right? So if we go around assuming that everything that's true in the world is based on our conscious experience, which is generally what we do, then we will never discover things that are not, that we're not consciously aware of. Okay. Then what is the implication of our unconscious uh, existence related to the external reality? If you're saying that our, our, our uh, unconscious can be um, uh, uh, can have some precognition, some knowledge of the future. W w what are the implications? Of that? Right. I don't like to use the word precognition in this context just because, because cognition is a conscious okay. it's a okay. thinking, okay. right? It's more like a predictive physiological activity, okay. right? Um, the implication is this. Um, imagine water flowing down a river, right? This is time flowing in a conscious experience, do, 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 right? This is how we think about the flow okay. of time, right? And in the river, you've got a stick or even a faucet, you got the water flowing over your finger, right? There's two effects of having an object in the way of the water, of the flow of experience. One effect is that you've got a wake downstream of, that's produced by the object. The other effect is that there's a little back pressure here that's built up by the water, pushing against the object, right? And trying to move around the object, right? So I've, I think of this object as like an, an emotional event. And it produces this conscious experience, this mm -hmm. arousal experience, but it also produces a little bit of a, <laughs> a little bit of a back pressure here in the water, so that you actually have like a physiological tell of something to come before you get there. And so, to me, this is a system. Without the stick, you don't have the conscious wake, you don't have the back pressure. With the stick, you have both. They can't be separated. Right, they're two different aspects of the same reality. One is flowing in a different direction. The back, the back direction, the back pressure is flowing that way. It's backwards. What I actually think 
is going on, and this is just intuition, this is not based from those ex the, that experiment, I think the unconscious mind is actually going both at least symmetrically in time. I think it's more like the physical quantities that we know are time symmetric. And I think the conscious mind is the only thing that gives us the arrow of time. And certainly the conscious mind is what allowed us to define the second law of thermodynamics. We say, oh, it makes sense because when I drop a coffee cup, it breaks. I never see a coffee cup come back together. So therefore, entropy increases over time, right? It's our conscious experience. But our con unconscious mind, I think, has different rules. And I think that's demonstrated in, in effects like these.